High-level talks between China and the United States in Tianjin. Was any progress made in relations between the two countries? Hello, I'm Arnold Nido, and this is The Heat. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman held talks with Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Xie Fong in China's port city of Tianjin on Monday. The talks come at a time of strained relations between the two global powers. Beijing says the relationship is now in stalemate and faces serious challenges. But is there potential for cooperation? We begin with this report from Beijing. Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Xie Fong didn't mince words in his remarks during a meeting on Monday with U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman in Tianjin. Washington said the goal of the talks is to keep high-level communication channels open to avoid potential conflict. But Beijing laid the blame for faltering bilateral ties on Washington, saying some Americans treat China as, quote, an imagined enemy and urged Washington to stop casting blame on Beijing for the U.S.'s failures. The fundamental reason for the current relations between China and the United States have been a stalemate is that some in the United States regard China as an imagined enemy, an attempt to deflate the U.S. domestic political and economic dissatisfaction by demonizing China. They will not succeed in such goals by blaming China for the United States' deep structural problems. The world today calls for solidarity and cooperation. The United States should choose to show mutual respect with China, with fair competition and peaceful diplomacy. China also reiterated that the U.S. is in no position to lecture China on democracy and human rights and urged the U.S. to address its own human rights issues first. China presented the U.S. with two lists. The first, a list of U.S. actions it must stop such as visa restrictions on Chinese officials and students and crackdowns on Chinese companies. The other was a list of individual cases that concerned China, such as anti-Asian sentiment and violence against Chinese nationals in the U.S. China also expressed disagreement with the U.S. on its stance concerning the origins of the coronavirus and issues such as Taiwan, Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Sherman is the highest-ranking American official to visit China since President Joe Biden took office. She also met with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Our panel will weigh in on all of this in a few minutes, but we begin with the former U.S. Ambassador to Brunei, Craig Allen. He's also the president of the U.S.-China Business Council, and I talked with him earlier. Ambassador Craig Allen, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Ambassador, the United States Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman is the highest ranking Biden official to uh, visit China so far. She's held talks with the Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Xiao Fong. Given the state of relations, the poor state of relations between these two countries right now, how important was this visit? Do you think uh, it gave the two sides a chance to perhaps dial down the temperature a bit? Well, there have been two sets of reports uh, on the meeting, one from the U.S. State Department and one from the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the reports are actually quite different. Um, so in looking at uh, the readouts of the meeting, uh, it does not feel as if uh, the tone was dialed down. Uh, rather, it feels uh, like the level of tension remains very high. Um, certainly, the readout from the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, emphasizes and underscores uh, all of the troubled points that the Chinese side uh, uh, perceives. The U.S. readout uh, was much more moderate, um, suggesting that uh, both sides were looking for um, a resolution of outstanding issues. Uh, Ambassador, those points that you mentioned, China presented the United States with two lists during the talks, so one outlining what it called wrongdoings on the part of the United States. China says the United States must stop these wrongdoings, including restrictions on Chinese officials and students revoking sanctions on Chinese leaders. And the other list uh, uh, talked about anti-Chinese sentiment in the United States, which has led to attacks on Asians here. Yeah. Um, is the United States, do you think, sensitive to these complaints? Uh, do you think they were heard here in Washington? 
Well, I, I was not in the meeting, uh, but uh, the United States uh, uh, diplomats generally don't uh, take lists of demands uh, very well. Um, it's not a, a normal way to conduct uh, diplomacy. Uh, usually diplomacy is a give and take, and uh, it does not appear like that was the spirit of these meetings uh, at all. Uh, now, all of the issues that you mentioned uh, are issues uh, that are outstanding, um, but I'm not sure that the Chinese side is willing to uh, offer any uh, constructive suggestions or alternatives uh, that uh, it might offer. Um, all visas into China are closed, and so it seems a little bit uh, interesting that the Chinese side is demanding uh, that the U.S. issue visa, uh, visas to Chinese students when no American students can get into China. And that type of uh, lack of reciprocity or, or, or lack of symmetry uh, continues to haunt the relationship. Right, Ambassador, given uh, what you're saying right now, you don't sound very pessimis uh, optimistic rather, about the outcome of this meeting. If the intention was to clear up differences, perhaps pave the way for a summit between President Xi Jinping and President Biden, do you think it achieved any of that? Well, the U.S. reading of the meeting was much more conciliatory, uh, that the two sides uh, had uh, good uh, frank and open, quote-unquote, uh, discussions, and uh, that the two sides emphasize that they are responsible for the management of the relationship. And so if I look at the U.S. readout, I, I am more encouraged uh, than looking at the Chinese readout. And I suspect that there's a little bit of both, uh, that the meeting might have opened with a little bit of uh, fire and fury, uh, but once that was over, uh, perhaps constructive uh, discussions uh, were entertained. I certainly hope so. That would be the pattern of Anchorage, um, and I suspect that we will learn more in uh, the next 24 hours or so. But right now, um, it does not look uh, as if tensions have been moderated. It, there is no evidence uh, that uh, uh, progress has been made on any of the substantive issues. Uh, so lacking further information, uh, I uh, am not confident. So what about the broader issues in this relationship? I mean, China has expressed concern uh, over the fact, over the, the way in which it is perceived in the United States. Uh, China has said that the Americans are portraying China as, quote, the imagined enemy, uh, but that demonizing China and trying to suppress it is not going to work. What do you make of that? I, I think that it's exaggerated and uh, is not particularly self-reflective. Um, uh, so bilateral tensions are at an all-time high. And I think that it's important for all of us, uh, particularly in the media, uh, both in China and in the United States, to be careful, uh, to be respectful, uh, and uh, not to make uh, wild exaggerations or blame one's own failing on uh, the other guy. Um, and I see plenty of fault to go around. Um, clearly, uh, there are people in both countries who wish ill upon the relationship, uh, and uh, the relationship, uh, therefore, is under pressure, and people of goodwill uh, need to stand up and uh, fight for what uh, is decent and, and, and rational in both countries. And uh, that's a challenge now that needs to be taken up. Well, these two countries are the two biggest economies in the world. The U.S. economy is the biggest. China is the second biggest. What is your assessment of the China-U.S. trade relationship right now? Do you, do you think the Biden administration is con going to continue to double down on what we saw during the Trump administration, which was what basically turned out to be a trade war? Well, uh, I think that in uh, last year, uh, in 2020, U.S. exports were up some 18 percent, uh, and that's a very uh, good uh, record. And I'm hopeful that uh, trade can continue to flow smoothly uh, between the two countries. Uh, the tariffs uh, put on by both countries uh, uh, during the Trump administration 
have had a very negative effect on trade. But for the most part, uh, exporters and importers in both countries have been able to find workarounds. Uh, and thus, the trade continues unabated. And I suspect that in 2021, by the end of the year, we will have surpassed new records. So while the official dialogue uh, at the Xiefeng, Wendy Sherman level is not uh, particularly uh, encouraging, uh, trade and investment uh, carries on uh, as uh, it ha always has. And I suspect uh, we'll reach new levels in 2021. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, the real economy, uh, companies and consumers, workers, uh, farmers uh, in both countries will not be too badly affected by uh, the diplomatic um, uh, problems that the two countries face. But we mustn't take that for granted. Mm -hmm. Uh, the bilateral relationship absolutely does have a negative effect uh, on companies uh, going both ways. And I'm hopeful that both governments will be respectful of the economic needs of their citizens uh, so as uh, to promote prosperity for all. Um, but right now, um, uh, that's a... That's a... Um, that, that's a complex proposition. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for uh, greater cooperation between these two countries? I mean, climate change comes to mind immediately, but where do you see other areas uh, where they can work with each other to improve this relationship? I think that there are so many areas of potential U.S.-China uh, collaboration. Uh, climate change has to be uh, up there at the top. But uh, together, uh, our companies, uh, if not our governments, have been collaborating on uh, both um, uh, personal protective equipment uh, for epidemic relief. Uh, we have been uh, collaborating on vaccines. Um, and I think that that type of collaboration is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are uh, about a million other areas uh, where the two countries could collaborate, uh, from curing cancer and science and technology uh, and to, um, uh, to uh, farming and, and uh, other environmental uh, concerns. Um, the two uh, countries are right. technological leaders across all of uh, every science across all of human endeavor. Yeah. And if we are able to work together, we will resolve the world's problems uh, more effectively. And if we are not able to work together, we will not resolve the world's problems. Um, U.S.-China cooperation is necessary yeah. uh, for uh, the global commons. And so I'm hopeful that on these important issues, we will find a way. Uh, to uh, collaborate okay. uh, for the common good. Ambassador Craig Allen, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Time now to hear from our panel. With us from Beijing is Shindo Shu. He is a senior fellow at the Pangol Institution, and he's the host of CGTN's Dialogue Weekend. Joining us too from Portland, Oregon is Yan Liang. She is a professor of economics at Willamette University. And with us from Beijing is Zun Ahmed Khan. She is a visiting fellow at Tsinghua University. Welcome to all of you. And Shindo, let me start with you. We just heard there from Ambassador Craig Allen uh, telling us that there were basically two readouts from this meeting, or rather the talks that took place. Uh, he said that the U.S. readout was rather more moderate than the Chinese one. Um, so what do you think these talks achieved, Shinda? Uh, well, if you uh, take a look at the U.S. readout, it's really, you know, it's about Xinjiang, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, mostly the Chinese internal affairs. Uh, those issues uh, are exactly the Chinese side is against uh, U.S. intervention. And then, of course, if you read the Chinese side, um, you know, uh, it's almost like a change of diplomatic style. The Chinese side has been very candid and straightforward in uh, expressing their interests 
uh, you know, one way is to, you know, put up the two lists of their concern, uh, two lists of uh, individual cases. Uh, they basically asking for the U.S. cooperation, for example, uh, the removal of uh, visa restrictions so we can cooperate more uh, in terms of uh, personnel exchanges between the two countries. Um, you know, uh, that, that's the area the two countries need to cooperate. Uh, uh, and uh, that's the area we can do, you know. Many of those restrictions are actually remnants from the Trump period, and there's no reason uh, for the Biden government to, to continue or to harden sometimes this uh, kind of restrictions because it's not in the interest of the Chinese side, not uh, in the interest of the U.S. side either. Shindashu, I want to address one other point that Ambassador Allen brought up, and that was the question of student visas. And he said uh, China does not issue visas to uh, U.S. citizens who want to study in China, so why should the U.S. issue visas? Uh, these are, uh, you know, on the surface, these are, you know, uh, almost like the same issue about the student's visa. Uh, for the Chinese side, the concern is like uh, China is singled out uh, for Chinese students' visa restriction or cancellation in some cases. And uh, for the U.S. students, it's really about the Chinese pandemic control because there's a zero uh, infection policy. It's very restrict. It's not only the U.S. students, also students from other countries. They are facing the challenges and difficulties to get the Chinese visa. I think this is a good thing, actually. The U.S. side should put forward such, uh, such demands, such concern, because this is engagement. You know, the U.S. side would say, you know, uh, I want to, uh, Beijing to do this and that. The Chinese side would say, I want Washington to do this and that. that. In this way, uh, we can cooperate. The two sides can cooperate. and. The, reduce their concerns. This is the cooperation, this is engagement. Uh, although, you know, their concerns are um, of different nature, actually. Yang Liang, the United States continues uh, to stress that it welcomes competition over confrontation. And talking there to Ambassador Allen, he talked about the tariffs that both countries have imposed on each other. And he said, look, in many instances, companies, exporters, importers, they've formulated workarounds, uh, these uh, tariff restrictions uh, in both countries. I mean, are you hopeful that these talks could ease the way um, to trade restrictions that currently exist? Right. So I think uh, the ambassador was right. So despite all these diplomatic stalemates, I think there's still a lot of economic connections that are under the ground. Um, so we have seen trade that pretty much uh, reached a low point uh, back in February 2020. But then it surged. Um, and if you look at the first half of this year, um, China's exports to the United States increased by 32 percent, and an import from the United States increased by 44 percent. So um, yes, despite all the barriers, the pandemic, the trade war, trade is to continue to flourish between the two countries. That said, I still think that it's important to redress these tariffs because they add onerous costs to businesses and finally the consumers. And I also think this is a, um, a fertile ground for the two countries to work together. Uh, remember, um, you know, uh, Sherman talked about that China need to abide by the international rules and take on international obligations. And I think one of the things is that both countries need to respect the multilateral approach, whereas, you know, the tariffs are pretty much a unilateral punitive approach. Um, so I think um, that is a ground for both countries to work together, and that is um, you know, when you think about all the diplomatic um, engagements, um, Liu He's telephone uh, conversations with, you know, Janet Yellen or Catherine Tai are actually the most amicable ones, right? They are less confrontational. So in terms of economic interests, I think there are a lot of common grounds for both countries to work on. And hopefully that would start soon, um, even though I do understand that Biden has these domestic political mm. um, obstacles to prevent that fruitful um, conversations on trade fronts. Zuna Ahmed Khan, let's look at the bigger picture and what appears to be the U.S. strategy in the region. Pre President Biden, while these talks were taking, taking place, President Biden also is sending his Secretary of State uh, to India and the Secretary for Defense is going to be in the region as well. I think it's going to be in the Philippines. In fact, the Washington Post reports that the U.S. is trying to build a coalition to counter Chinese influence in the region. I mean, is this all part of the broad U.S. strategy to uh, contain China? 
firstly, Anand, thank you for having me on the show. And um, yes, I think obviously when we look at specific numbers in terms of trade, uh, the bilateral relationship between China and the U.S., these talks, this moment, uh, even though uh, we don't see uh, much understanding coming up, in fact, both sides are raising certain criticisms, uh, it's, it's a positive sign that they're engaging each other. But when we look at the bigger picture, I think the strategy or the approach that the Biden administration is assuming, the posture, is one which is kind of outdated. We are not living in a world where countries can be told, should be told to pick sides. The fact that China has been successful without being a supposedly Western democracy has also encouraged other countries to pursue their own paths. And when I look at reports, when I look at uh, official communication coming out of Washington, uh, talking about like-minded countries, democratic, uh, a certain kind of democracy that needs to be promoted, I feel like the world has moved on. Asia is rising and we are supporting each other. So let's talk about specifically uh, even their trip to India, uh, his official tour to to India, they want to strengthen the Quad and supposedly what reports are saying react to China's Belt and Road Initiative, react, uh, form a coalition, an alliance, so to speak, against China's increasing influence. And I think this is something which needs to be understood, that China, for instance, is not asking countries to pick sides. No country, regardless of how rich or poor it is, should be asked to choose a side. Each country should be pursuing its own pragmatic interests, which means balance their relationship with China and the U.S., with the region, etc. So I think in the bigger picture, if yeah. I look at kind of official communication that's coming out, China is not pushing a confrontational path. In fact, what China is saying is something that a lot of countries would say, stop interfering in our domestic affairs, stop being moralistic, stop telling us how to govern, help. As, as, uh, as a superpower, as an important country, the U.S. has immense contributions that can be made. But uh, being moralistic and pushing countries into a sort of alliance is outdated, and I don't think it serves the long-term interests of their own either. Okay. Shindosho, the hope was that these talks could perhaps uh, you know, put in motion a process that would lead to a summit between President Xi Jinping and President Biden. And given the deep differences between the two countries, as is evident, uh, does that make a summit even more important right now? I think so. I think, you know, despite all this uh, uh, lack of confidence or, you know, being sort of like a pessimistic uh, about this relationship, many, pe uh, many people say this is the lowest point uh, in terms of uh, the, the bilateral ties here. Uh, but I think if you look at the approach, you know, both sides have made it very clear their interests, where their interests are, and uh, what they are expected out of the other parties over there. I think, you know, everything is on the table. So that's a good and honest way of dealing with each other. Of course, the relationship has changed between the two countries. Uh, but still, I think they can manage that, uh, you know, uh, competition is fine. Uh, as long as there's, it is not running into conflicts or uh, confrontation, serious confrontation, or even leading to war. Uh, Yes, uh, there is a need, some, uh, you know, bottom line, respecting of the bottom line of both countries, or God real, using the, the, the language of Washington. Uh, I think this is a conducive in this sense, and also uh, that will probably uh, lay the foundation for the summit between the two leaders, say, in October uh, for the G20 summit over there. Uh, I, but I, I do think there is one obstacle. That's really the U.S. domestic politics. Mm -hmm. uh, there is pressure on the Biden administration, for example, from the Republican Party. Anything uh, constructive to the bilateral relationship uh, would be seen as being soft on China. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to the Biden administration and the president himself, whether he has the courage and also so to, to make this very uh, difficult, but the right decision uh, to maintain stable relationship between two countries, uh, as we talked about the trade, which uh, you see the increase of trade, right. despite the tensions between the two countries, uh, reflects that there is a strong demand on both sides mm -hmm. for cooperation. Yang Liang, of course, there's the politics in all of this, and there's also the trade relationship that you were talking about a moment ago. We heard from Ambassador Allen there that... Uh, trade is up 18 percent and is set to be even higher by the end of this year. So given, even though we hear all this rhetoric, all these differences, etc., cetera, um, is it fair to assume that this trade relationship is in fact going to get bigger? 
Yes, I think so. I think you know this pandemic, uh, if anything, has shown that these kind of economic connections are so important. Uh, without which, I think the global economy is not going to function well. And China has made endless efforts to um, honor the uh, you know purchase agreements. And this year, you know, China has been purchased millions of tons of agricultural products. Even though China is still kind of behind at this point, um, as of May this year, um, the purchase agreement uh, that China reached. Uh, China purchase agreements right now is still falling behind about 69% of the agreed amounts. But that again is because of this demand disruption and the supply side also disruptors. Um, and I think you know in the bigger picture, Biden's trade approach I think uh, will be more realistic and also um, hopefully will be more sort of mutually beneficial. And it put, it's probably will be foregrounded by you know the tech war and yeah. supply chain management as opposed to you know just a simple um, trade war. Um, and I think there's also also broader connections when it comes to foreign direct investment, when it comes to you know financial flows. Yeah. Um, despite the warning on you know Hong Kong, um, we have seen you know the fi finance giants in the United States, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and all of these are doubling down on their hiring and presence in Hong Kong. So I think um, the reality is there are a lot of economic connections that are going to continue um, to foster our head, to forge ahead. Right. Zuna Ahmed Khan, I've just got a little bit of time left, but I want to address this issue. You know, when we talk about the relationship between the United States and China and where there's uh, room for cooperation, we always hear about climate change. Um, uh, but, you know, as the New York Times pointed out, isn't there a problem if the U.S. on the one hand is seeking cooperation with China, but yet on the other is trying to uh, contain and damage China. I think 100% um, it's not a compatible approach. Uh, it's not possible to contain China's development. I wouldn't even say just China's rise. China's basic motivation to gradually and in a sustainable way, improve the lives of its people. This is the focus when you look at China, when you look at the way people think, the way the government approaches its own uh, strategy domestically. This is their way forward. Uh, yesterday should be, today we should be better than yesterday, mm -hmm. step by step. So for a, uh, for a United States to supposedly say that we want to cooperate with China on issues such as climate change, but at the same time, as I earlier said, try to uh, develop a strategy, coerce yeah. China, it's something, first of all, it's going to be impossible. And secondly, I think the United States has not confronted right. a country with the inertia and magnitude of China as yet. Okay. And in due time, they should recognize that China's rise is inevitable. It is a reality and let's yeah. engage it in a better way. Thank you. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. It's been a great discussion. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.